My name is Niels de Vos. I work on Gluster. I'm one of the co-maintainers. And um, I will just tell you a bit about the current state and the, the features that, that we have. So um, a very short introduction. Gluster is a POSIX-like file system. It provides access through different um, protocols, including um, normal file system access, like fuse mounts, NFS mounts, um, object storage, and also block storage through, for example, KMU um, with direct with native drivers. There is no metadata server. So LizardFS, the talk before, has a metadata server. Um, Gluster doesn't have a metadata server. Ceph doesn't have metadata servers for the object store. Um, we prefer to calculate the position of where the data is instead of asking someone about where the object to find. So our clients are a bit more smart and we actually know where the data is instead of keeping track of, of everything. Um, Gluster runs on basically any kind of hardware at home. I run my Gluster environment for testing and installation media and everything um, on small 32-bit uh, ARM systems. Um, that works perfectly fine. At Red Hat, we have many customers that run on uh, pretty decent Dell, HP, and any vendor you can imagine kind of hardware. So um, from the small things to the big things, we do everything, basically. Um, sizes are important, so you can scale up if needed. Add more servers if you, if you need more storage. Uh, integrations with, so you use it through Fuse, NFS, Samba, or any of the other tools. Um, there are integrations with different projects. So if you want to store backups on uh, Gluster, you can use, for example, Berios, back all your workstations, and Berios knows how to speak the Gluster protocols and automatically store your data there. Um, and of course, it's a backup solution, so it can also recover it. Berios even has the option to backup Gluster volumes. So Berios is a whole field featured backup solution. And if you want to backup your Gluster volume onto tape or Amazon Glacier or anything slow cold storage, um, various and other backup tools would be able to do that. So we even have uh, partnerships or, well, um, work together relationships with commercial products um, that use Gluster and um, provide offers like that for backup. Replication is one of the main features. So this is a distributed replicated Gluster volume. You see on the top, there's a distribution algorithm than the replication algorithm. So very similar to how this um, mathematical uh, description works, we do first the distribution on one layer, and then the second layer does the replication. In our case, it's completely disconnected. So we run in these, into these kind of problems. There's no connection between those algorithms, and um, that's not always the most efficient use for disks and um, you run into unexpected issues. Instead of using replication and distribution, there is also um, erasure-coded options. So you can use, um, we, we call it disperse, it's erasure-coded, so it's like a RAID 5 over the network. It's a bit more complex because Gluster by default uses everything based on files. So you have distribution based on the whole file. The file will locate it on one of the bricks. If you do replication, this particular file gets replicated exactly to all the bricks you need. Um, so it's really file-based. And in absolute emergencies, a system administrator can go to the storage, go to the XFS file system or whatever file system you use, and you see the files. You can access the files without using Gluster. We don't recommend it, but if you're in an emergency situation, you can actually do this. So administrators feel very happy about it. With, uh, with dispersed volumes, files get split in chunks and get encoded so that you have the erasure-coded um, bits. If you go to the back end as an administrator and you want to read the file, you only see the encoded bits and you have only a couple of encoded bits on this particular server. You have another couple of encoded bits on other servers. So you somehow have to reconstruct this. This is something that is relatively new. Um, we don't see a very high rate of adoption because administrators don't feel 
too confident about this um, because they just can't see the contents immediately what they used to see with previous or other type of volumes. So this is something that um, we're working on and um, has arrived like two years ago maybe for the first time. So in the meantime, it's, it's very stable. It's used everywhere. But um, many users still are not very eager to adopt it. It also comes with a bit with performance penalty. But that's um, all the Gluster packages are part of um, many different distributions. So we try to push the packages in, um, for example, in Debian, there's a version of Gluster. In Fedora, there's a version of Gluster. Um, we provide them for the CentOS storage SIGs. Um, there is a NetBSD contributor that pushes the cluster packages into NetBSD. There has been work with FreeBSD people to put it in the ports. I'm not sure what the current status is because one of the maintainers that was doing a lot of work there um, find something else to do, so we probably need to pick that up again. Um, but yeah, we try to make it really easy for users to install Gluster and make sure that every distribution has um, its native installation support. There are several quick start guys. Um, the documentation through Gluster.org. Um, but for example, some of the distributions offer their own wikis, and you can go to the wiki pages there. Recently, we changed our release schedule a little bit. So we were doing releases roughly every six months. And every release was maintained, like up to two releases um, until the, the third release, follow-up release would be done. So for example, 3.5 release was supported until, well, this is the old schedule, so it was uh, planned to be supported until uh, the 3.10 release was done. Um, unfortunately, six-month release cycles were not very ideal because every release would have like 30 new features. It would be a huge amount of features, and users cannot easily go through these features and say, OK, what's new? And um, I want to try this out. I want to try this out. But we would overwhelm users. Um, developers that work on se several months on a feature, they would like to see this feature. Sometimes small features is like one month or two months development cycle. And they would like to see the adoption of the feature or have feedback from users. And waiting six months for the next release would be really long. So we changed the release schedule um, with the current releases. And um, now we do a three-month release cycle. So that makes it possible for developers and users to try out new features and get feedback and everything. Um, but we can't require users of a storage solution to switch every like six months or maybe nine months of their storage solution. Users prefer to have a stable solution and don't want to upgrade too often. So what we do is we have a long-term maintenance release. 3.8 is the first official long-term maintenance release that we have. And um, three months later, 3.9 gets out. 3.9 is a short-term maintenance release. It is supported for three months until the next release gets out. So with the release of 3.10, 3.9 gets deprecated, abandoned, um, 3.8 is a long-term maintenance release, so it will still be supported and get um, bug fix updates and everything. And this is the, the current approach that we're taking. 3.10 was uh, has a release candidate, I think, was tagged last week. Um, and is planned to be released uh, in the com coming weeks. So we're doing some tests and make sure that everything is there. and. Um, We'll get it released uh, surely before March. With the 3.9 release, which is a pretty current short-term maintenance release that's still being worked on and, and bugs get fixed in this short-term maintenance release, um, we had uh, additional commands to ease the replacement of bricks. Um, Multi-threaded self-heal existed for normal replication, but it didn't for erasure-coded replication. So um, now we have multi-threaded self-heal for erasure or dis dispersed volumes. Um, also for erasure-coded volumes, we added um, uh, CPU optimizations. So we have some of the assembler code for um, the erasure-coded 
uh, erasure coding functions that we have so that it's more optimized than the CPU. Not that the CPU is normally a bottleneck, but with erasure coded volumes, you definitely have more CPU usage. And um, if you have low end hardware, then these optimizations make, make a difference. Sometimes clients take a look on a file and this file has an, um, or the client has an issue. The lock needs to be revoked. And we have a CLI op gotten from uh, CLI is a <coughs> the common client interface. Um, Facebook uses Gluster a lot and they don't really care about their crashes that they have on client side systems. So the Facebook team that provides the storage interfaces, they say, well, applications is not our business, but they tend to crash, they forget to release logs, and we cannot wait for the timeouts that it takes to detect this kind of log loss or application loss. So we want applications to take over immediately. Um, so we added a functionality to actively revoke logs on demand when the application management interfaces notice that an application crashed or is not responsive anymore. They kill the application and they revoke the logs as well. Um, so it makes it a bit more flexible and everything. We have bit rot detection. So if data changes on the back end or disks start to return uh, non-fatal read errors, um, we can detect them. And um, it's a background process that runs every so many times. <coughs> now there's an on-demand way of triggering this scrubbing and checking. We added more APIs um, so that you can do eventing. So any of the management infrastructure around cluster needs to get notifications. And um, notifications are important to know when um, bricks or servers are missing or crashed or disks are failing. Um, and display these events in a web interface is important. Um, it really helps administrators to figure out what's wrong. They don't seem to like to go through logs anymore. Everyone wants a web interface. So we needed a notification API to provide this. We also improved our geo replication. So we have a multi-site replication and uh, it's always a bit tricky to set up. So we have an interface to make it a bit easier to configure. That's also command line. Um, 3.8, the time before, um, already added some uh, REST APIs. So you can configure cluster through REST APIs. Um, mostly Heketi does this in combination with Kubernetes. Um, we added improvements for sparse files. Sparse files over a network are useful that you do not read the empty areas. So if you have a gigabyte file, um, which only contains a little bit of data and then maybe at the end of data, um, and the middle is empty, it's sparse. Over a network file system, you prefer not to read this empty area. You prefer to skip it because reading, for example, zeros um, is not very efficient and it would cost just a lot of network bandwidth. So backup applications were not very happy with it, that it wasn't existing, and we added that in the previous release. Um, again, geo replication, because it's one of the big functionalities that we offer in Gluster. Um, we made it tiering aware, so we have a tiering. Uh, you have a fast tier and a slow tier, and now geo replication can actually do that decently. Sharding is splitting from big files into chunks. Uh, geo replication didn't do that efficiently either. Um, that has been addressed. Some users use only two copies of the data instead of three, what we recommend. Um, if you have two copies of your data, you can run into split brain scenarios, which is a problem. For that, you have to resolve them, and you resolve them um, in Gluster with a policy-based split brain resolution. <coughs> so that means that you can say, um, the biggest file is always the correct file, or the file that is updated last, or um, several of these policies, policies now exist. And um, it helps administrators immensely. They don't have to recover or fix the split brains um, for every single file. They just can set the policy on this particular type of volume for this particular kind of workload, and they pick whatever solution they, they would like to see best. Um, yes, in the previous release, we added multi-thread self-heal. 
Um, I'm sharing this loop with Patrick, so I don't know how much time we have left. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Um, so 3.7 is the current oldest release that we still support. Um, if you have not upgraded to 3.7 yet, many of the users stay on the release that they sometimes install. So we see a lot of users that are still using 3.6. 3.6 does not get any bug fix updates anymore. 3.7 is the oldest release and it gets out of support or out of maintenance um, within the next couple of weeks when 3.10 is released. Um, still, um, these features are not known to many of the users. Um, so we have small file performance enhancements, so like mail directories um, are still not very efficient because it's really a lot of small files and file systems just don't like small files. Especially network file systems don't like small files. But we improved this and um, there's work, or there has been work going on a lot to enhance it already. Um, Tearing, so hot, hot tears and cold tears that have um, data that is used a lot are on fast storage and data that is not used much is on cold storage. Um, Windows users like to be able to undelete files. In, in the Linux and Unix world, we just delete a file and we know it's gone. Windows users don't seem to like that. They want to have a trash directory. And um, they want to have this kind of support on Gluster as well. So we have a lot of users that use Gluster in combination with Samba. And um, they requested us to provide like a trash or recycle bin directory where the files are still there in case they deleted something. Um, and they can just copy the files back if they want to. So improvements in NFS, so more advanced configuration, also um, contributed by, by Facebook. So Facebook tends to send huge, large features that they use internally. Um, and that's, that's actually quite nice. So most of the times we get really small uh, changes or improvements from, from users, sometimes bug fixes. Uh, but Facebook actually sends like li 10,000 lines of code changes in patches. Um, it's not always easy to go through those, but um, it's, it's actually quite nice to see those features. Um, yeah, one of the hot items is NFS Ganesha. Um, that's coming. Just, just yell if you want to replace the Gluster stuff with Ceph. <laughs> um, so uh, NFS Ganesha is one of the things that's coming and uh, more adopting much more. So with 3.10, NFS Kinesia is not enabled by, or NFS Kinesia is the suggested NFS solution. Gluster NFS, the old NFS server, is uh, basically deprecated and will fix bugs in it, but we won't spend much time on, on enhancing it further. Um, brick multiplexing at the moment for every storage unit. So for the people who were in, in Orit's talk, the OSD is like a storage unit for, for Ceph. Um, bricks are a storage unit for Gluster, and uh, we use a, a process per brick, which is fine as long as you do not have too many bricks or too many, too many volumes, because a volume needs a number of bricks. Um, with the container kind of solutions that are happening, um, people want to have small volumes, but just really a lot of volumes. So instead of the huge data storage and file systems that we normally do, um, containers want small volumes, so like 50 gigabytes of volumes or 100 gigabytes of volumes, and we normally would go into the, the terabytes for storage. So instead of this couple of big file systems, um, we now have to provide many small file systems. And for all of these file systems, if you start processes and more processes for the bricks, that's a bit of cumbersome to manage. Um, so we have brick multiplexing, that is actually one binary or one process um, obviously multi-threaded um, that uses multiple bricks um, and that enhances the performance for these kind of workloads quite a lot. So that's coming up next. More metadata cache enhancements. So enhance mostly enhancements for small files. Um, so if you store home directories or Git repositories on Gluster, uh, 3.10 will improve performance quite a bit there. Uh, NFS Kinesia and Samba will use 
Storehawk. Storehawk is a project that is an HA solution for um, well, storage environments. And at the moment, we suggest to use CTDB for Samba environments, NFS Kinesia with Pacemaker. Um, and Storehawk actually combines the same approach uh, for both NFS Kinesia and for Samba. It uses Pacemaker, and um, that's what we will use for uh, or suggest our users to use. Um, we'll test it much more than we test CTDB and, and Pacemaker separately. So we have one project that we use for everything. It makes it much easier for users to set it up and um, they're familiar with, with the setup then. Um, we split it out the tier I mean, from the sort of tiering process is now managed by GlusterD and you can easily um, check its status and see if, if there are any problems or how busy the process is and everything. So it's, it's a bit more easy to manage and we'll be able to debug things more for applications that have <coughs> integrations. So KMU, for example. More improvements for tiering are coming. We still do not support subdirectory mounts over Fuse. If you need subdirectory mounts over NFS or Samba, you can do it, but Fuse doesn't allow us to do that yet because how we have our, our internal structures for, for volumes. Um, so that's something that we really want to address for 3.11. We tried it to get into 3.9, but some of the developers got busy with other tasks and now they want to put it in 3.11. And that's happening in like three months. So hopefully they have the time to look into that. As a Linux on cluster volumes is something Jiffin will speak about this afternoon. Um, Server-side DHT to improve uh, read there. So by a standard, we have all our logic done on the client side. So the client knows about the distribution. The client knows exactly where all the files are. That's all fine if you just know the file name and you need to open the file. But we have mainly Windows users that like to do ls or there or open their explorer window and see all the files. Um, read there is very inefficient because you have to connect to all of the distributed parts. Then you have to com combine all the results and display it decently because read there is a kind of funky. Um, you get a whole stream of directories, but you can also rewind things. So um, you can basically seek in a POSIX way through a directory list. Um, and that means that if you seek back and forth, the order of directory or the order of entries still needs to be roughly the same, um, which is very difficult in a distributed environment. So we're moving part of our distribution logic to the server side, where the server actually does some kind of magic details and um, the client can actually do the read there and the rewinding and everything a bit more efficient. So that's also coming in the next like three months. Um, yeah. Hopefully this summer we'll get Gluster 4.0. Um, the first talk this morning was from Korshal about Gluster D 2.0. Um, Gluster D is the management demon. It's re being rewritten in Golang and it's one of the key components for Gluster 4.0. Um, because we, this, uh, this rewrite is mainly done to improve the scalability. So make sure that we can address like 1,000 cluster servers more efficiently than that we can do now. If you're now going over like 100 cluster servers, all of the servers talk to each other. So it's very inefficient, and you will most likely run into bottlenecks if you don't have too much network bandwidth and network disks and everything. So um, cluster 2.0 will be a big improvement for the management infrastructure. We'll do things like um, iNotify, so um, you can actually listen for on a directory and see if the new files get added or not, and things like that. Um, that's something that people really would like to see. Uh, uh, the Gluster protocols use SunRPC with XDR encoded, very similar to NFS, uh, but they are not really secure that way. Um, we do have SSL support, but SSL support is from one client to a server and not on user base. So if you have multiple tenants on a server, they would all use the same SSL um, connections, which is not really appreciated by many. So um, we want to provide the same security that um, NFS offers, because NFS is well known by many organizations. They seem to use Kerberos mostly, 
and um, we would like to use uh, the same infrastructure that they use and uh, provide Kerberos support for Gluster. Uh, warm retention and compliance is something that people want as well. So similar to life cycle kind of ways, unable to delete a file until the next two years or something like that, uh, move a file um, to a particular directory when certain events happen or so. Um, those things are, are coming, but it's, it's slowly because it's not really on our priority list. Um, hopefully we have a bit more functionality in the 4.0 release. We have basic warm features, but um, they're nowhere to what people expect from compliance um, approved warm. So we have simple write ones, read many kind of features, but um, it's just like toy and um, nothing really, really official. That basically ends my slides. So um, you have some minutes left to talk about Seth. <laughs> If you have any questions about Gluster, um, I'll be around in this room or at the Gluster booth in the K building. Um, don't hesitate to email the users list or um, anything that in the IRC channel. So we have uh, the uh, hash Gluster on Freenode. Um, we have quite some users all over the world that post questions, answer questions, everything. All right, as uh, he mentioned, I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about what's going on in the Ceph community lately. Um, <clears throat> as some of you came in late, I know that uh, this talk was originally supposed to be about the Ceph user committee. Uh, and Vito was going to cover some of the, what was going on in there. So I will hopefully touch on a few of those things. But those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Patrick McGarry. I'm the director of community for, the, for CEPH at Red Hat. Um, just wanted to touch on a few things. There's always a lot going on in the CEPH community. So I just kind of wanted to touch on a few of the highlights in the few minutes that we have left here before we get on to a, a real presentation. So. Um, one of the great things that we like to do throughout the year is uh, our CEF Day program. Um, it's basically we go around the globe, uh, find somebody who wants to host, and have a whole day event uh, about uh, CEF. So individual members from the community will come in. They'll talk about what they're doing. Uh, and the reason I bring this up is uh, we, will have, we have plenty of uh, CEF Days that are coming up this year. Uh, the ones that are already published, uh, we have San Jose on the 17th of March. We're going to be in Boston during OpenStack, and we'll be in the Netherlands on September 20th. Uh, some of the other ones that are in progress right now, I believe we are headed back to Frankfurt. Uh, we may be in Stockholm and Warsaw in April, and uh, we'll also be probably in Taiwan. We'll be in Sydney during early November. Uh, and several others. But if you look at the, the new Ceph website uh, at slash Ceph Days, uh, you should see them as they become available. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about also was that uh, the, we're moving to the new metrics platform. Um, so right now we have metrics.ceph.com. It's a great dashboard, shows all of the kind of ins and outs of what's going on in the Ceph community. Uh, it was built by the Biturgia guys uh, with us. So those of you that were at GrimoireCon this, uh, this past Friday, you'll already know a lot of this. Um, but we're pretty excited about where we're headed next. Um, we're moving to a Kibana-based dashboard, so you'll actually be able to play with it and dig into the numbers. But more importantly, we're also launching a new tool called Ceph Brag. Um, this is a, a part brag and part uh, tool. So, Users have the ability to do some performance tests on their Ceph clusters and share the, that performance data with the Ceph community at large. And this is great. They can share, you know, I've got 1.4 million IOPS on my cluster. Look how awesome I am. But in the other side, it allows uh, users that are either new to Ceph or looking to improve their footprint in Ceph to uh, take a look at this Ceph brag tool and sort by use cases that are similar to what it is that they're doing. So 
take a look at people that have you know large numbers of files that are small files uh, and check out other people that are doing similar things see their hardware footprint see their tuning options uh, and get a, a much better idea of kind of where they should start uh, so we're hoping it'll be a little bit of both uh, as I mentioned Vito was originally supposed to be here to talk about the user committee the user committee was the kind of first little baby steps into governance uh, that we took about three and a half years ago. Uh, and it has since grown into a, a very nice uh, part of the community uh, underneath the now uh, CEF advisory board, which is our actual governance. Um, most recently, they've been involved in helping with our release cadence, uh, doing contributor credits, and most notably, our mirror network. So Ceph is actually building a functional global mirror network. So we're very excited about that. We have mirrors in uh, China, Australia, a couple in the EU, a couple in the US, uh, and more are coming every day. I believe there's one plant in, in Japan uh, and several throughout Southeast Asia. So very exciting to see that. Uh, and anyone can become a mirror, assuming you meet a couple of simple guidelines. So if you're interested in that, definitely go check it out. Um, it's on the Ceph website. It's also in the Ceph doc, um, and you can you can check that. If you can't find it, let me know. I'd be more than happy to point you in the right direction. As I mentioned, we have uh, real Ceph governance now. Uh, this launched in October of last year. Um, we tried to get a pretty good representation across the entirety of the the Ceph ecosystem. A little bit of the academic roots, uh, a little bit of the individual contributor roots and then some of the larger players that were making kind of long-term strategic bets on Ceph. So we wanted to make sure everyone had a voice uh, in helping to drive Ceph forward. Uh, the nice thing is Ceph, as you know, as it was designed, uh, no one can really own Ceph. Red Hat may own the trademarks, but no one can actually own the code. Uh, it was deliberately built with a uh, fractured copyright or a distributed copyright. So anyone that contributes to Ceph owns their contributions in perpetuity. So that's nice. No big bad can come along by Ceph and, and make it evil. So uh, it's, it's nice to see that uh, a lot of these companies that are doing large contributions are also getting involved in kind of helping to drive the community forward as well as the code. Uh, Ceph Tech Talks. So if you would like to know more about uh, deeper levels of technical things uh, associated with the Ceph community and tangentially related projects, uh, every, every month we do a Ceph Tech Talk. It is the fourth Thursday of the month. Uh, it's done online so anyone can join. Um, this one we hold at the same time every month, so I don't flop it around like the, uh, the developer monthly. But uh, 1 p.m. Easter, I think, so that's only like 7 o'clock here, so it's not too bad. Um, we usually have a pretty good variance of, of speakers, everything from core team members. Uh, I know Josh has previously talked about RBD, uh, Sam talked about Rados, uh, all the way over to the other side where people are talking about integrations work and management tools and things like that. So it's usually a, a pretty good hour's worth of uh, deep technical Ceph discussion uh, and a great time to ask questions. And if anyone wants to talk about their Ceph work, you're more than welcome. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have the Ceph Developer Monthly. It's the first Wednesday of the month, and we alternate this one. Uh, so usually we have kind of a US East and uh, Europe friendly time zone one, and a US West and uh, APAC friendly time zone, uh, depending on the month, and we alternate back and forth. Uh, again, this is online, and it's usually designed for people that are doing work on Ceph to get together and say, Here's what's coming, here's what I'm working on, and make sure everyone's kind of aware of what's going on. Uh, the biggest thing in the community lately is uh, newceph.com. We launched a new website. Uh, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. Uh, there's definitely some, some great resources there, and everything is a lot more discoverable. So if you haven't stopped by ceph.com lately, definitely give it a shot. Uh, we can skip that. And the, the big news uh, for this year is we are holding our inaugural Ceph conference in August uh, 23rd through the 25th in Boston. So it will be the first all Ceph conference uh, that we've ever held. We're pretty excited about that. Definitely uh, take a look and come by if you can join us. So that's the end of the Ceph community updates. I'll be around if anyone has any questions. Uh, otherwise, I believe it is about time to start a real presentation. So uh, we'll... we'll <laughs> Thank you.